Good morning and good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to Attracting Today's Higher Ed Students, the fourth webinar in our Enrollment Growth University webinar series. I'm Eric Olson, AVP of Marketing here at Helix Education, and today I'm joined by Shalise Eastman, our AVP of Integrated Media Strategy, and Michelle Bates, Executive Director of Marketing Strategy and Research. Now, this is the webinar that I've personally been the most excited about in the entire series, and the record number of attendees we have here today shows that this topic is top of mind for a lot of you as well. Because I think we all know that old brand and marketing strategies won't help us attract today's new higher ed students. But what will? It's simple. You just have to deliver the right message to the right student on the right channel at the right time and for the right price. Simple, right? Don't worry. We're going to dig into it all and leave you with lots of practical takeaways. Michelle Bates is going to walk you through how to develop an authentic brand that's relevant to today's new higher ed student. And then Shalise Eastman is going to walk you through specific marketing channels and talk about how to allocate your marketing budget and build an integrated marketing plan uh, to maximize your total number of starts. Now, just a reminder, this webinar series is based off of our enrollment growth playbook. And if you haven't received a copy, I highly encourage you to stop by our website after the webinar at helixeducation.com and download your free copy of the second edition that was just released today with 50% brand new content on how to solve today's most pressing enrollment growth issues. And at the end of today's webinar, we're going to leave a lot of time for questions, and there are a couple of ways for you to get involved in today's presentation. First, here in the WebEx, we'll be using the chat to accept questions during this webinar, so please type your questions at any time using that function. Second, ask questions and engage with other listeners on social media using the hashtag HelixWebinar. Additionally, we are going to record this presentation, and all attendees will receive a link to the recording after the webinar is ended. So without further ado, it is my great pleasure to hand off to the fantastic Michelle Bates, our Executive Director of Marketing Strategy and Research here at Helix Education. Good morning, everybody. We're very excited to be here with you. Um, just a quick overview of the agenda. I'm going to be doing a very quick overview of the changing landscape of your higher ed audience, and then I'll be talking about understanding brand versus identity. Then I'll be handing the baton over to Shalise, who will be talking about exploring your media channel options and capabilities, as well as developing an efficient integrated media plan. So let's take a look at the changing landscape of the higher education space. It's exciting. I'm sure I'm going to be going over some facts and figures that you guys are very aware of, but I want to make sure we're all on the same playing field as we get going into this. So first of all, there are fewer overall students. So overall, the number of high school graduates is expected to drop 2.3% in 2017 alone, with continued dips through 2023 solely due to population changes. Enrollment and revenue goals aren't static, as everybody knows. This year, 32% of private colleges and 22% of public institutions revised their tuition revenue goal downward at least once. As for the enrollment target, 28% of private colleges lowered it as the year went on, as did 19% of public institutions. And finally, overall post-secondary enrollments decreased by 1.7%. Happy Tuesday! <laughs> but there's some other things happening in the landscape that matter just as much as dropping enrollment rates. One of those for me personally is that students really are starting to make some different higher ed choices that are eating away at those enrollment numbers as well. Some of those are that they're learning skill sets, especially digital, on their own. We're seeing programming is being taught for free on Steam and other websites. They're moving into skills-based certificate programs and apprenticeships, such as machinery. And there, a lot are attending boot camps. COHE reports there are well over 200 boot camps across the U.S., giving them over 2% growth in 2016 in students and dozens of additional locations and brands. As well, the U.S. Department of Education is running a pilot program that awards financial aid to a very select few. They're monitoring that. And then big for-profit players like the Apollo Group are adding brands such as the Iron Yard to get in on the action. And the third and final piece that's, I think, the most important piece of all and something that we can all understand and really piggyback on that knowledge is the evolution of the higher ed audience. 82% of all consumer internet traffic will be video by 2020, according to Cisco, and we're already seeing a lot of that. 52% use YouTube or social media for research, and 33% of our potential students watch lessons online already. 70% watch over two hours of YouTube per day, and Generation Z, uh, according to quite a few reports, has only an eight-second attention span. So what does that mean for us? We'll get into that a little bit later. The final piece I think is very, very important is the multiculturalism that we're seeing in the 
in the new and upcoming generation. Generation Z are the last generation to be majority non-Hispanic white at 52.9%. However, the numbers geek in me look, says that if you look at the mixed, mixed ethnicity Hispanic white population of Gen Z, when you add that into the multicultural total, Gen Z is actually the first minority majority generation in American history, which means understanding that multiculturalism among your potential students is incredibly important. All of these things really lend to the idea that content isn't simply consumed. In 2015, the market research firm Wildness conducted a study on 12 to 24 year olds in the US. The company's top conclusion, this post-internet generation doesn't simply consume entertainment, it helps to create it and shape it, leading to quite an evolution in how we look at brand and how we look at integrated media strategy. So I know some of the stuff I said isn't always that great. It's that potential oh crap moment. You have a diminishing potential audience. You have a totally new type of future audience. That means that your current lead generation models are becoming obsolete. And in the next three to four years, what you're doing today won't be the same. But I think that it's a really great opportunity. Darwin sort of has us covered here. He said, it's not the strongest or the most intelligent of the species that survives, but those most likely to adapt. And that's why everybody's on this call today, is they really want to understand how to adapt. And I'm excited that there's a lot of great stuff. So how do we adapt with brand? Well, brand is having a coming of age. 76% of higher education marketers have conducted a brand strategy project in the last two years. 42% have cited increased competition as a key motivating factor for that and 38% say that enrollment growth was the primary driver. But even though they're doing brand analysis, most of our industry's currently branding initiatives don't work at the hardest working levels. They fail to support all of our offerings, our channels, and our audiences. Additionally, they fail to connect on an emotional and differentiated level all the way through the funnel and beyond. And the reason for that is people are looking at brand and not identity. We have to connect and engage with our potential consumers to win. So the reason why engagement and connection is so important is this idea of the rise of the referral rate and digital influencers, which at least we'll talk about more. The decisions that you make in the next two years will absolutely determine your success over the next eight because of referral rate. Well, what can you change right now that's really going to matter? What's the difference between a brand and an identity? Well, in our opinion at Helix, the anatomy of a truly integrated brand is that it is un, it's authentically unstatic. It's constantly changing and moving. It's a movement. It's not a movie. It's both authentic and relatable. It works across all channels and audiences. It maximizes efficiency at every touch point. It works from brand to programmatic. I like the idea of thinking of branding as a verb. The essence of branding is storytelling. When done properly, identity and strategy can become as compelling as the preface to a great book or the opening scroll to a Star Wars movie. And then, of course, it takes somebody like Shalise and her team to really put into place a good integrated strategy on top of that. It's just the beginning. Brand is not about font, color, logo, and vision statements. They're an important key piece to what you do, but that's not really what brand is about. Your brand is your authentic identity. It's who you are what you offer that's unique, why you do what you do, and where you will take your students as a university. You have to create one university, one voice, one identity. How you do that as a company, in our opinion, is understanding your true competition. It's very difficult to tell how to create a voice that's going to resonate with your potential consumers if you don't know who you are and you don't know those pieces of your identity that can rise above the noise in a very, very overpopulated environment. So how do you understand your true identity? Well, first, we think it's very important that you understand the distinguishing factors to look at between you and your competitors. The institution type, how much they're doing in media spend and where, total enrollments and competing courses, Take a good look at tuition costs and where you fall in that mix. The acceptance rate, if you're a school who has an open acceptance rate, are you really competing with a school that has a 16% acceptance rate? 
the number of competing programs you have with that potential competitor, and the number of completions in, that comp in those competing programs. If you, all 50 of your programs, there's a competitor out there that offers all 50, but they aren't completing anybody in those programs, they're not a true competitor. So those are just some of the factors that we look at here. On top of that, we really want to understand what they're saying from a brand perspective. What is their identity? What is their voice in market? If you have something that's very important to you, such as your flexibility and schedule, but all three of your major competitors are marketing off of that point, what other points do you have that distinguish you and differentiate you that you can use to rise above the noise of your competitors? Finally, you need to understand and outline your true brand and competition by doing a messaging competitive analysis. You need to look at what they're saying on their websites, in their social media, in all of their different channels to really understand what they are using as their voice. And then you need to look at what you can potentially use and how it differentiates from them. We recommend doing a competitive analysis and a brand and white space analysis where you place all of those competitive messaging onto a grid to see where the grid is overpopulated and where there is room for potential movement within your brand. It allows you to find areas where you can really be, you can own that messaging and you can own that strategy. It's just very important that that be authentic to who you are. So once you've figured out what some of those key branding points are, you need to build out your brand identity. And one of the things at Helix that we feel is very important is if you look at what you are and how you do what you do, you will never create an emotional and differentiated messaging platform with your potential audience. You really need to understand why. So when you're creating that branding identity, it's important to know what and how, but it's very impo important to remember to focus on the why. Also, identity and branding are more than just messaging. It's really about messaging hierarchy. Once you've created that messaging, it's about putting it in the right channel to the right audience at the right time. We believe very strongly that you can win through an integrated and fluid storytelling platform. One of the great things about education is it can take a big business approach where it looks at the data, it does the feasibility studies, it looks at all the same things that a product or a business would look at, but it can combine that with a nonprofit connectivity of a university. For most of us, our alma mater matters to us 20 and 30 years later. You, the university you attend is part of who you are as an individual for the rest of your life. So as a university, if you can combine a big business approach with that nonprofit connectivity, you can have a brand direct win, that emotional connection with your potential audience. So the skinny, less students equals more competition. Know your true competition and where the openings in the market are. Develop your authentic brand and create messaging that can rise above the noise and attract the right kind of student for the benefits that you offer. And market that messaging correctly. And when it comes to marketing messaging correctly, nobody knows that better than Shalise Eastman. So I'm going to turn the time over to her. Great. Thank you so much, Michelle. That was fantastic. Um, so there's a lot there, right? And it's uh, a little bit depressing to some extent. Um, you know, we're, we're fighting an uphill battle. So where do we begin, right? These are, these are important questions for us to really address um, and work through and understand how we can actually be successful in a competitive and difficult market. First, the biggest, most important component of being successful is determining where you have been and more importantly, where you're trying to go. So how do we do that? There are some important questions that I think every institution should answer. Uh, you know, I've been, I've been in the education sphere quite some time, and I, unfortunately, a lot of, of the institutions that I've had um, the opportunity to work with can't necessarily answer all these questions out of the gate. So I would say don't be disappointed or, or disheartened if your institution can't answer all of these, but keep in mind that these are the, the, the components and the places you need to be understanding and working to understand long term to be successful. So what's your goal? What's your enrollment goal? How many students do you need in a certain period of time? What is your current cost per enroll? And what's your cost per enroll goal? We should all have those benchmarks in our mind and we should know how we're aiming towards those targets. More importantly, if we're trying to determine a cost per enroll um, threshold or, or some way for us to determine our marketing return on investment, we need to know the lifetime value of a student. 
Um, it's important for us to know what we're making as an institution on those students and, and student types. Um, I would say that you need to, to, to work to understand those by degree level at a minimum uh, because we know that you know, an undergrad student will be different to our institution um, than a master's level student will or, or an associate's level student. Um, and so it's important for us to understand just exactly the lifetime value of those students to us. How are our inquiries converting to enrollment? That's an important component of this as well. And then how are our, ch our channels performing for us directly and indirectly? Um, that indirect question is a difficult one for these days, but these are important questions for us to ask ourselves, um, ask our peers and be aware of and work towards answering. So the biggest way for us to make kind of headroom in this area or to go down this path is to set up goals and track against them. Um, and I'll say it's not too late to start doing this. It's an important component of everything that we do we are spending more and more money every year trying to acquire the students for our institutions. And so it's important for us to be able to understand what we want those channels to do for us and quantify what they're actually doing for us. Um, one of the best ways for us to understand some of the success is what's our EDU site doing for us? That's our storefront. Um, that's where every consumer that comes to our institution is going to interact with us at one point in time or another. And so we need to understand how it's working for us and, and more importantly, how it's not working for us right now. And so um, I would encourage you, if you don't already um, have Google Analytics set up on your EDU sites, um, to work to, to get that set up. Um, if you're not familiar with Google Analytics, um, they do, Google does offer an Analytics Academy um, that you can take for free, um, most of the courses. And it's a, it's a great kind of resource and asset for us to understand, in general, how it works, and then how we can be successful in setting up some of those trackers in terms of um, on your request for information, any of the tags, setting up campaigns, those types of things. And so really the, the foundational component of answering a lot of those questions is knowing, um, you know, kind of what's happening and what's going on on your EDU. Secondarily, it's, it's important for us as we implement channels as marketers to understand really what those channels are able to do for us and what they're capable of doing for us long term. Um, so you can see here, this is a, a sample chart that we share with a lot of our partners and, and prospective partners to really set, level set a foundation of what channels can do for us um, and really what they can't do for us and some of those points of potentially diminishing returns. Um, so you can see here, they're, they're sort of bucketed by relatively low cost per enrollment channels, medium enrollment channels, um, and then those things, those executions that tend to be more along the lines of conversion enhancement. Um, they don't necessarily drive a lot of direct traffic for us and provide a lot of lift for us overall um, directly, but they do provide lift indirectly for sure. Um, these rates and these numbers are built off a long-standing history that Helix Education has with the adult learner. Um, so if you look at these and you typically work on your undergraduate side, um, you can very, very easily say, no, 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 this, this works much, di much differently. A great example of that is direct mail. Um, direct mail is still a very, very um, engaging and, and successful channel on the undergraduate prospecting side, uh, but it's not as successful on the non-traditional adult learner side. And so, um, you know, it, it, it's important to know that these rates are reflective of the relatively large percentage of our population now that, that is, it would be considered a non-traditional learner. Um, and so just going from left to right, you can see the different channels, um, the buckets in which they reside. The primary uses of those channels, so you can see um, how they vary from inquiry generation to branding um, to, you know, just general awareness, um, keeping inquiries engaged. There's a variety of, of uses of these channels. The volumes that they're generally able to provide for us overall, um, what it costs us to capture that volume, um, and then the rates at which they typically enroll and how that works out to a cost per enroll. So again, getting ourselves back to that cost per enrollment goal and understanding what they're doing for us. Now, it's important to note here, um, you know, and this is, this is an uphill battle that I think a lot of marketers face. Um, Michelle talked about the rise of the referral rates. Um, referrals, especially in the digital world, are a, a consistent component of every, every education or institution's um, marketing portfolio. However, if I, as a marketer, could fill my entire funnel with that, I would do it tomorrow, and I probably wouldn't be here anymore talking to you, um, but that's not really possible, and that, that's the uphill battle that a lot of us marketers face is that there's increasing pressure to fill the funnel with low-cost, high-quality, organic type of traffic that's going to really blaze through our funnel regardless of what we do, 
Um, and that's not really um, a reality for most institutions these days. And so this, this channel kind of capability chart really does a good job of setting that foundation of, of what we're able to do um, and what channels can do for us across the board. We're going to jump in to more specifics about some of these direct channel buckets and those types of things, but I wanted to make sure that we had an opportunity to see for that non-traditional adult learner how we tend to see um, different areas or different types of execution performing nowadays um, and how these are, are moving and shaping as the world is changing and moving to a much more digitally based um, consumer population. So we're going to jump into paid search first. Um, this is the, the king of education marketing these days. Um, it's the DRTV of old. Um, and so it's an it's important component of every um, institution's buy. Um, and there are a couple of different components here. I know we have a variety of, of um, participants on the phone with us today. So some of this, if you're a, a marketer at an institution, will be very clear and straightforward to you. But it's important for us to understand not only what those channels are capable of doing, but what they're good at and what they're not so good at for us. Um, and what it kind of costs us in terms of building awareness, how well we can target within those channels, um, what the cost of entry is, if there's any, the cost of acquisition, and how they tend to convert. So just a little more nuance or detail into what some of these executions are. Um, so you can see paid search is an exclusive inquiry to us, um, and they have high intent consumers across the board. So if we were to flip back to that channel contribution slide, you would see that paid search in general has some of the highest conversion numbers overall for paid inquiry generation channels. Um, some of the cons, there's a lot of competition. This is the go-to place. Um, there's a high cost of acquisition depending on the strategy, uh, but it's an important component for us because we know, um, you know, Google releases education-specific studies all the time, um, and the numbers just keep going up. So we know that on average, eight out of 10 education seekers when they start their education journey, don't necessarily know where they want to go to school. Um, and this is especially true for the non-traditional learner. Um, most searchers will fill out somewhere between three to five different requests for information forms. Um, and Google, of course, reports that nine out of 10 university enrollees have searched for some kind of, some kind of education search prior to enrolling. Um, and so it's, it's an important area for us to be. We need to be very tactical and strategic in this area. Uh, because most of us are going to be outbid no matter what we do um, in, in certain areas. So we need to own what we can own, which that branded search area we should own for sure, um, and then really be competitive and specific in that non-branded search area. So I wanted to make sure that I gave you some tools today as well. So we talked about the Analytics Academy, um, and the digital world is one of the best areas to, to really get free and valuable information. Um, and I say free-ish because all of these are free at first, uh, but then some of them, in terms of when you start to seek additional information and try to dig in a little deeper, they may say, oh, oh, no, this is restricted um, unless you have a membership. And I will say um, some of the memberships are, are pretty cost effective, uh, but wanted to show you some of the things that are available out there for you when you're, you know, facing a typical um, situation that a lot of our partners face in terms of what are we doing in paid search, what are our competitors doing in paid search, um, we want this new program, we want to bring on this new program. Should we do it? Should we not do it? Uh, you know, and having more than just a, a dean or, or uh, some, you know, very excited faculty driving this decision to really understand where consumers sit on this type of decision. So I'm going to pop out of this really quick and jump into a couple of those tools. So the first is the Google Trends tool. This is a free tool, free um, from the beginning. Um, and so I'm just going to show you an example here um, of, of what the Google Trends dashboard can do for us. And you'll see it's, it's more than just education, it, it encompasses all the world that Google um, captures. And so there's a lot of interesting information here just from a human perspective, um, but there's also a lot of interesting information here from the education side. So you can see, um, I can pull up the search term, term online MBA, um, and this will bring up certain um, results for me. Um, so we're gonna actually type in here business administration, because I wanna compare um, results. Um, and you can see here, it brings you some options. You can typically start with the search term, um, and this is the search term exactly. They do also categorize degrees and then topics. Um, so as you move through here, you can start to see some of the differences there. But for this example, we're gonna go with the search term. And then I can start adding comparison areas. Um, you can do comparison areas by geo, um, by any number of, of areas. So I wanna pull up healthcare administration. 
And again, I'm going to do the search term here. And you can choose different areas, right? So you can do worldwide. I obviously want the United States. Um, and you can look at different time periods. So for this one, I'm going to actually look at the past 12 months so that we can see perhaps some more detail about how things have changed over the last 12 months. You can also look at different categories. So this is all categories considered. Um, they do have an education category. So it's jobs and education. Um, they have a variety of, of educational categories and you can start to see how these differ. Um, and then they give you search options, right? So you can see image searches, news searches, shopping searches, and YouTube searches. So there's a lot of stuff here for us for free. Um, and all of these work basically on an index type of basis where the top maximum interest in any given time receives 100. Um, and then they fall out in relation to that across the board. And then it shows you subregion interest and it will compare the regional interest for the two topics that I'm comparing. So you can see for business administration, the top related query is degree. Um, and it can give you, you can do the top, you can also do the rising um, types of topics. Um, and then I can also go and see what healthcare administration is doing. And you can see the differences there um, and how things are different. So for healthcare administration, the biggest watch search is jobs. Um, and degree is only at 70. Um, where the jobs are at 100. So you can start to see how things compare to each other. Um, you can do this for your brand name. You can do all type of, uh, types of searches on here to really understand what's taking place. Um, you can also utilize the ad preview tool. So if I'm a marketer um, and I want to expand into a different region, for example, um, perhaps my institution is offering a new satellite location, I, and I want to understand what's going on in that area paid search-wise, but I don't physically reside in that area, um, I don't want to necessarily skew my results by placing a geographical restrictor onto my actual search. I can come in here and search as though I'm a user in that location and see what's taking place. So I'm going to change my location to New York City. Perhaps. We'll go with Salt Lake for now since this doesn't seem to be agreeing with us right now. Probably too much use here on this webinar. Um, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to search for an online MBA. And then what I can do is I can actually, actually preview those results in this region. Um, and what it's going to do is it's going to pull up a preview for us of the results. And right now you can see I'm searching for desktop or laptop computers. Um, and I'm searching on the .com domain. Doesn't usually take this long, but something adventurous for every webinar. You can also do a mobile device. You can select your operating system version or a tablet. So let's see if it'll if it'll be a, a little nicer to us trying a different version. But you can see it then switches your screen to show you how the ads are even displaying on that screen. And then it also works on a tablet and it'll do the same thing. It'll switch on the tablet here. and load those. So it's not going to show us results right now, but that's okay. You get the point. Um, and so this, again, is another totally free tool um, that Google provides to um, any users who would like to utilize the ad preview tool. The last tool I want to take you through really quickly is SEM Rush. There's a couple of options of this type of tool, um, SpyFu, SEM Rush. There's a couple of others. Um, like I said, they will give you free stuff, but after so many searches, they tend to require um, a little bit of payment in terms of, of a membership, a monthly membership. But I wanted to show you what these do for you. So I'm going to pull up a large domain here. And we're going to do a domain search. We're going to start with a domain search. So this is a really useful tool in terms of understanding your domain and also competitive domains. Um, and we'll talk through some of the other things that they offer for here uh, on their site for free. Um, and they will give you a certain number of searches a day, and then they tend to cut you off and say, no, now it's time to upgrade. And so you can see um, they show you the general search results, backlinks, display advertising, keywords, ad keywords. You can see the differences between organic and paid, 
you start to get down here and see top organic keywords, the position distribution of those organic keywords, the main organic competitors. I don't think anyone's necessarily surprised by these top four, um, where they're positioning in terms of organic keywords and how they sit against each other. The branded search terms, branded versus non-branded, branded traffic, top paid keywords, um, and di distribution of those, main paid competitors, where they sit, sample ads. So I can come in here and see sample ads. Then they get into backlinks and showing us who's referring to us, where are they referring from, um, some of the top anchor sites, referring domains, indexed pages, publishers, right, ad text of those, sample media ads, and then video advertisements if they can find them. Um, and so this is overall for the domain. So from an organic and an SEO perspective, there's a lot of good information here. Now, obviously, University of Phoenix is a very, very large institution, um, and so their results tend to be uh, likely a little more accurate because of the scope and quantity and size of what they're doing. Um, I would let you know that this is a, a third-party tool that, that captures this information from what they can find and see on the web. Um, and so if you go in here and search your own domain and see things that don't appear to be in line with what you know to be true, um, don't be surprised, but they are better than not having that information um, overall. You can also get into keyword analytics um, and see some of the information they have here in terms of the overview, and then they do phrase match, related keywords, add histories, right? And so you can start to really see what's happening and where things are happening at, the ad copy that they're using, uh, the history of those ads. I mean, they just give you so much information here. And like I said, most of it is free at first, uh, but this is a really, really great tool uh, to understand more along the lines of what your competitive set's doing, what they potentially are paying for these things, um, and, and how things are working for them. So those are a couple of really great resources um, that I, I think that everyone should, should, should know about and should use. Um, and so I wanted to share those with you today. So we're going to jump back in. The next channel that I wanted to walk you through so that we're on the same page is affiliate marketing. Um, it's a you know, scalable and consistent channel. Um, it can provide you with a lot of volume, um, but it also is highly, highly competitive. There might be some questionable tactics involved in there um, and low conversion. We know that th there are you know, potential issues here with conversion, but again, it can provide us consistent um, and good steady volume. Display is also another very interesting channel for us. Um, you know, it is a kind of relatively good awareness tactic, but we don't necessarily see consistent results in terms of driving high inquiry numbers. And you can see that in those, these tactics in terms of prospecting, trying to, to find new inquiries, and then retargeting those that may have visited you but didn't necessarily make it through the funnel and persist into your program. Um, and so it's a very good brand um, strategy. You can do a lot of targeting um, in a lot of these tactics. You can see a lot of success with this um, in terms of driving your brand forward without necessarily have to, having to invest a lot of money um, like we would in, in the days of old in terms of billboards and uh, television and radio and those types of things. We can, we can get a lot more bang for our buck here. Social media is actually a fantastic channel um, that is definitely risen in terms of its influence um, on my marketing buys um, in the last few years. Um, I think everyone has some interactions in some way or shape or form with social media, um, but we are actually seeing very, very great results in terms of the paid side of it, being able to drive um, a high number of, of fairly decent quality inquiries. And so I would encourage you, if your institution is not doing a, a good job on social media, to really look at this area and determine how you can do a better job here. Um, it is definitely moved away from the personal perspective of interaction, and consumers are more and more looking to it for um, purchase decisions and life decisions and those types of things. And so we're seeing better and better, um, you know, capture of traffic and really interest in this, this area. Direct mail. Um, I would guess most of you on the phone have probably had interaction with direct mail. Um, it is a uh, tried and true tactic of, of all institutions, I think, across the board. Um, and the one thing I would say, you know, is, is I definitely understand the influence it has on most undergraduate populations. 
um, it, it's not necessarily as successful on the non-traditional populations from a prospecting perspective, uh, but it is always very successful on what we call the remarketing side of things. Um, and so this is a very, very simple strategy that will always be um, one of the most cost-efficient strategies that a marketing portfolio can have. Um, you know, so when I talk to pr prospective partners and institutions and they ask, you know, what is the one thing I should be doing, no question, my answer is almost always remarketing. Um, and it's a, an investment into that mail. You can email them. We can also tack on some display and make it a very integrated type of outreach campaign. But really making the most of your house file um, that, that you may have deemed to be cold, dead, gone, um, you know, but you've made that investment. That investment is sunk. So let's get the most of it that we possibly can. Um, and so this is a very, very critical kind of strategy to ensuring that you are maximizing um, your investment and getting the most of, of everything that you've put out in the market. Um, but the one thing I would say here is that this is not a quick moving channel. Um, we do have, you know, customers that have come to us and said, well, we, we want to do this right now and, you know, to help our start next month. That's not how it works. Um, it's one of those things that you have to invest into and you have to really be dedicated to because it is a slow moving channel, um, but it will always be a very successful part of our marketing buys um, and has proven that time and time again, regardless of the audience. Um, it, it just kind of stands the test of time. And so it's something I would definitely encourage you as an institution to make sure that you are investing in. And then obviously there are a variety of other awareness channels um, that we implement um, and that I would recommend to you. Some of the, the major ones I wanted to mention here or talk about here are the streaming channels. Um, you know, we've seen a lot of success with streaming um, over the last couple of years um, in terms of transitioning our clients who are heavily dependent on very expensive, um, very robust um, kind of offline or more terrestrial-based uh, buys. And we've transitioned them to a streaming buy, um, which just increases their reach and frequency. It increases their ability to stay on air. It maximizes that budget. Um, now, it's not necessarily you know, this for that. Um, we do have a mix of these tactics and strategies that we're using, but it can be a very, very good way for your institution to start dipping their toe in perhaps into more of a mass media type of execution um, without having to invest tens of thousands or even hundreds of thousands of dollars into major awareness driving channels. Um, and ultimately, right, this brings us to what is an integrated plan output look like? Now I have some examples for you here, uh, but again, it goes back to some of our original questions. We want to make sure we know what we're investing into and the expectations and the goals of those channels that we're executing and what we expect for them to bring to us. So here's an example of a channel execution, um, the different channels that we're using and what we're going to spend there. Um, and, and in terms of the, the years, the timing, the inquiries, what it costs us, how it converts. Um, and so for us, it's really important for us to know, again, where are we aiming and what are our expectations um, and how do we get there? And so this is just an example of, of what you should expect, especially if you have an agency, what you should expect from your agency to provide for you. Um, now know that all of these are not necessarily going to happen um, right away, right? It does take time for us to um, you know, see these channels mature and to see them um, really get us to to full capacity. And so for us, it's you know, it's it's a long-term view, um, but but it's good for us to know where we're aiming for these channels and how we're going to evaluate the success of those channels long-term, how we allocate the budget across, and what those expectations are on a long window. Um, and then this is speaking to that conversion cycle, right? This is the a difficult component of all marketers in the education sphere is that we're not a quick purchase, right? We're not going to have someone come in and say, yeah, I really want this. I'm going to do it right now. Um, and so it's one of those things where we have to be able to um, understand and, and really know when our investments are going to start to mature for us and how they're going to start to mature for us. Um, and so for us, this is an easy way for us to see that and to really understand what's going on. So what's next? Well, like I mentioned, because we are bound to that long conversion cycle and you know all of the kind of influencers that can come in and really impact the overall success, it's really critical for us to understand early indicators of success. Some of those early indicators of success are contact rates. Can I contact these inquiries? Are they qualified for the program in which they express interest? 
do they engage in their applications? Are they moving through? Are they applying and then actively providing the components needed to successfully complete that application? Also, have we seen other organic increases? So again, this comes to your Google Analytics report. Um, it comes to other factors of showing, you know, perhaps my streaming tactics have increased the number of brand searches that I received, um, you know, over the last couple of weeks. So they, there is a far-reaching effect of all of the things that we do, but we want to really understand as quickly as possible what's going on and what's working and what's not. Then we want to work towards continuous optimization. So to that point, what's working, and then also what's working together. Um, you know, branded search is a great example of that. The chances of a human just searching for me by name the first time out of the gate are slim. I've definitely done something that has influenced them, um, whether that's through a referral from, you know, my friend who attended that institution, or if they've seen my advertising on television or Facebook, there's been something that's happened for them to know me by name um, and search for me by name. Then I want to review performance on a consistent basis, and I want to adjust my strategy. Maybe it's adjusting the messaging, maybe it's some of the creative, or maybe I need to adjust my spend. Um, and it might be all three together. We might need to do all of them at the same time. Then I want to implement and monitor those changes. Now I will say, um, if something's just not working, you may need to knee jerk and, and potentially change the messaging, creative, and spend. But typically we don't like to do all three of those at the same time because then we don't necessarily know, um, you know what may have been our, our kind of issue or problem there, or maybe it was all three of them together. But once we've made those changes, we need to implement them and then monitor what they're doing for us back to those early indicators. You also need to be mindful of the internal impact of your changes and or successes, and we hope obviously for successes. Um, you know, as you implement these types of strategies and you really grow, um, you know, the quality and the number of inquiries that you're bringing in to, an, to your institution, uh, that has an impact, right? And as you look to expand your audiences, those audiences have different um, expectations of your institutions than maybe your current population that you serve. Um, so a great example of that is if you have a long history of serving, you know, 18-year-old college students who live on campus, and you're really looking to branch out into the, you know, non-traditional kind of adult degree completion world, you need to understand that those consumers have a vastly different need of your institution than that 18-year-old who may live on campus, right? If, if my only time to work on my coursework is at 10 o'clock at night and I can't get help or answers or those types of things, I'm going to be really frustrated and chances are I'm likely not going to persist in that program because I can't get the support that I need. And that's not saying you need to operate a 24-7 shop, but you need to be mindful of the changes that you have. And also, you know, if you drive an exponentially large amount of volume compared to what you've done, that is going to impact your friends at admissions or enrollment. That's going to impact, um, you know, your technical teams and, and maybe your library services and those types of things. And so it's just important to be mindful that marketing always, we will always have an impact down um, the stream. And so we need to be thoughtful and, and, and communicate openly about what we're doing and what that may cause to our peers at our, our institutions. So just a quick recap for us. Um, it's important to know your numbers, right? If we don't know where we're aiming, we're never going to be successful. So know those enrollment goals and know the cost per goals. Um, so, you know, if you potentially don't know your cost per, a lot of institutions have, have a difficult time kind of cobbling those together. Perhaps you can use maybe the chart that we provided to set a benchmark and say, we want to aim for this and then figure out how we can measure and track ourselves against it. Um, and it, an important note about that chart is those are costs directly related to the media execution. Um, so it's not going to be the same as if you take your total spend and just divide it by the total number of students you brought in. Um, that's very different. So those are the cost pers that we see directly related to those channels when we are able to tag and attribute, um, you know, inquiries and students to those channel tactics. You need to also determine and execute your channel allocations. Um, you know, you can't be everything to everyone, um, and the same is true of your marketing tactics. And so it's important that you really put your money um, in a way that drives the most interest for you and that can really be successful for you as an institution. Measure everything, please. Um, and this is a critical component for every marketer these days because everyone is always quick to go after our marketing dollars. Um, and so if we're able to measure successfully, then we can show the return on investment and we can show why it's important that we not only keep receiving those funds, but perhaps receive more funds to drive what we need. Um, and some of that comes back to those goals um, and those cost per goals, right? Something as simple as saying, 
you know, what is my total overall buy and how many students do I have to get? And if you're looking at a sub $2,000 cost per student enroll on a, you know, $60,000 program, something's probably not right there. Um, and so we need to, to make sure that we are being logical and reasonable in, in terms of what we're expecting to get um, from our marketing efforts. And then obviously we need to continuously monitor and optimize all of our buys um, and really drive success um, to the extent, the best extent that we can. Terrific job, Shalise. Terrific job, Michelle. Thanks so much. We've received uh, tremendous feedback on the back channel uh, so far about how this was a really helpful one-two punch of really taking a hard look at the message that we are um, promoting in the marketplace. And, and uh, not only does this accurately reflect us, but are these value propositions that the new higher ed student actually cares about? And then once we have a messaging platform that we are really excited about, how do we effectively spend across all these digital channels that we might not be uh, super familiar with? So really, really helpful one-two punch. As promised, we left a lot of time for Q&A at the end, so feel free to continue to add your questions to the Q&A or uh, use the Helix webinar back channel on social. Um, and I'll jump right into these questions. Shalisa, a great one for you from uh, Andrea Ribeiro. She really appreciated you going through the tools that we utilize here at Helix. Uh, any suggestion, uh, it made me realize, I think we should actually do a tools webinar so we can, that we can really dig into some of these digital tools that we're utilizing on a daily basis. But she got excited about uh, some of the SEO ones and the Google Trends ones. Um, where can we find more information about other tools like the one shown? How do you stay top of mind about what the industry offers, both from a free and paid standpoint? Yeah, so that's a great question. Um, so there are a lot of tools that are popping up um, every day, honestly, because there's so much to be had in the social world and in the digital world. Um, you know, unfortunately, probably the easiest way to find the available tools and to stay on top of it, um, one of the easiest ways is to just search Google, right? And Google will bring you up um, some of the best results. Um, there are some decent social follows and those types of things. Um, that, you, that you can follow for some of the tools. But in general, um, I find and our team finds here that some of our best success comes when we're, when we're searching thoughtfully for what we need um, and really what we, what we can use. And again, as I mentioned, there's a lot of overlap in some of them. Um, so I showed you SEMrush. SpyFu is almost exactly the same. Um, and so there, you know, there's not necessarily a benefit to having both of them. Um, but as you start to use them, and the, the, the benefit is that most of them will give you some semblance of a free trial um, so that you can start to, to plug in your information and see what they provide you so you can understand that overlap and not necessarily have to sign up for multiples um, to, to learn that lesson the, the more expensive way. Um, but in general, like I said, depending on what you're searching for or what you want tool-wise, um, we do have a couple of others um, that we find success with that are a little more helpful on the, um, the SEO side as well. Um, so Moz is also a great tool. Um, but there is a variety of tools out there, and, and like I said, for us, um, in general, some of the conferences and those types of things that we attend will show certain tools, but the best way for, for everyone out there to just keep up with it, I would say, is just to, you know, consist somewhat frequently search Google and see what pops up for you and if there's anything new out there, because most of the time what happens is someone new will pop up, and then they end up being acquired by someone major who's been around for a while, and so um, there's not necessarily... A, Great resources, great resources out there to follow, but um, there's basically any type of tool you would want, you can find at least for a limited time free use. Yeah, and uh, Jeff Handler gave us some great feedback. He already started digging into SEM Rush, and he said they did ask for a credit card, so you're going to have to investigate which, which tools have free trials and, and which don't. Uh, Shalise, another one for you, uh, a great question from D Bowling, and it's one that, that we get uh, a lot from our clients, and it's a, it's a definitional one. You talked about the power of referrals, and I think if I'm reading into this question, she's a little bit skeptical of that. She says, well, what do you mean by a referral? Um, because she says specifically, are fairs part of this, um, like visitor fairs? And, and again, that's a, a very common, I, I think, uh, uh, incorrect assumption by a lot of our clients of what we're at least talking about when we talk about referrals. And so she wants you to uh, clarify what you mean about the power of that channel, and, and, and what are we actually talking about, and what are we not? Yeah, so that's a great question. Um, so I am not talking about fairs um, because I think that we get behavior in those fairs that is not necessarily the behavior that we would see in a normal referring situation. Um, so when we talk about the power of referrals and really, you know, if I could fill my funnel with those, I would. I am talking about um, the case in which I know Eric um, and Eric knows that I am searching for 
a degree to further my education. Um, and Eric is also going through that process of, of furthering his education at this moment. Um, and we have a, you know, the coach has a conversation with Eric and says, hey, Eric, you know, you're on board. We're going through this. Do you happen to know anyone else uh, that might be on this track with you or, or along the same lines as you? Um, and Eric says, by the, by the way, I actually do. My friend Shalise is actually thinking about going back to school too. You should probably talk to Shalise. Um, that is a referral, right? And we can have those digitally, which is the nice, nice way. Um, is we, you know, we always want those conversations. I'm far more qualified when we've had a conversation with you. Um, but you can always um, capture those individuals through digital channels as well, right? So social sharing, um, friends commenting on social posts. Uh, there's just so many options these days that didn't necessarily exist when we were without the internet um, that really make referral strategies a lot easier for us. Um, they may not be you know, as, as good because I might get more of them, um, but in general, I want, when we talk about referrals and really the power of that, it is someone I know referring me um, with nothing on the other side, right? So I'm not entering a drawing, I'm not doing any of those things. I'm just saying human to human, I know that this person is, is on this path with me, so you should probably reach out to them and see if, if they're interested. And Dee, feel free to uh, uh, submit a follow-up in the Q&A if that did or did not answer your question. Michelle, we got one, one really good one for you that, that I hear a lot. Uh, some of my colleagues have optimistic beliefs as to who our competitors actually are, pointing to the biggest and most selective national brands nearby or in our niche. Any tricks to helping get by on, on what our true competitive set is? That's a really good question, Eric. I find that the best way to do that is through facts. So we believe at Helix that your competitor is the person who is taking your potential students away and putting their butts in their seats. That is sort of our take on that. And there's a lot of really good free tools out there. You can use iPads. They can show you who some of those competitors are and how many people are being graduated in competing programs. Uh, in the webinar that we just gave, I did give a list of items that I think are really relevant to helping you truly ascertain who your competitors are. And part of that is competing programs, how many people are in those programs, whether or not their acceptance rate is similar to yours. And I believe that really looking at key facts like that will help you to work in conjunction with the other people at your university to really make a good competitive argument for that. We hear a lot of times that someone isn't a competitor if they are not at the same caliber of quality as your institution, which we really understand. I mean, if, they, if your potential student was to look at all of the great things you offer versus that competitor, they would definitely agree that you are the better person, the better university for them to attend. But sadly, there's no way to really market that. Uh, our marketing dollars are small. We have to really focus in on one or two things. And so understanding who is taking your potential clients away from you is the most important thing you can do when looking at your competition. And then finding out what you do that's better than them or what you can market on that's a message that's differentiated and emotional. Those are the things that will really help you to win that argument over and help you come up with a really good integrated media strategy to compete against that, especially if you are the better university. Awesome. Thanks, Michelle. And, and Dee actually gave us a, a great follow-up question. Uh, I misinterpreted uh, her question. She was specifically asking uh, of, of what your perception of, of fares are in general. So they stopped going for a while because they were – um, a lot of cost, a lot of staff, a lot of, of, of man hours, and not digital. They sounded antiquated. They stopped going for a few years. Their numbers went down. They started going again this year. They've seen some really good numbers, uh, but from these very costly initiatives like theirs. Does this come back to just a knowing your numbers and doing the math and really making a good case for whether it is or should be a part of your marketing arsenal? Yeah, and I think it depends in terms of those fares. It depends on the audience also that we're targeting with those. Um, you know. Sometimes at the undergraduate level, they can be successful. They can be successful at the graduate level for sure. Um, and so it's just really being mindful of who we're targeting and, and at what rates they're going to be there. And then what I would encourage your institution to do, Dee, is to you know, compare the success of those to your marketing channels, right? So that cost all in of the, you know, all of the staff and the timing and the travel to get there and all of the, you know, brochures and the, the giveaways and whatever else you're doing at those fairs. Um, I don't want to make a blanket statement that fairs aren't worth it. Um, I, I do believe they can be a successful component of a marketing mix depending on the strategy um, and the, the audience that I'm going after and really my, my goal. 
um, in terms of cost pers. Um, and so, yes, Eric, to your point, it is definitely about going and understanding um, those cost pers and really then measuring that activity against it and also exploring other potential activities that you could reach those same individuals, perhaps through a more cost-effective way. Um, and so if it's not necessarily face-to-face -face interaction at those fairs, um, perhaps there's a direct mail list where you could get in front of those people and then also you know, put some display in front of them or maybe you could target them um, heavily on social in certain areas if there's a one fair that's very, very expensive for you to get to and is not as well attended perhaps. Um, and so I would really, and this is something we ascribe to here when we're, you know, um, requested to attend events and those types of things, is, is we set goals for those events, um, both inquiry goals and then really enrollment goals, and then we see how they do against it and what that costs us and what I could have gotten in another media execution. Um, and we can't always grow all of our media executions at that same rate. Um, so it may be, you know, I don't know that it has to be an all or nothing for your institution D, but that there might be some that are very, very worthwhile for you overall. Um, and there might be others that aren't um, that could be cut to really save that money and that effort. And I would just add one quick thing in there. I apologize. Um, but we have found that measuring down the funnel for that is really important too in terms of retention. We have noticed that sometimes when you have a personal interaction like that and gaining a student, your ability to retain them is better. And so if you're noticing a very high a very high increase in retention among that channel, it might be worth it, again, to Shalisa's point of understanding how much it costs to attain that student and how much you're going to get out of them over the life cycle of that student. Just something to think about. Super helpful. Thank you both. Uh, another one for Michelle. Uh, our administrators have been very excited about getting our programs online, but now that they are, we have hundreds of competitors for these online programs. And we're a mid-sized university with a strong local presence, but not much of a regional national one. Any tips for standing out in the competitive higher ed market? That's a very good question with a very lengthy answer. Um, what I will tell you is I believe very firmly in the idea of feasibility studies. Helix is very research oriented and going online is an incredibly huge move and going online correctly in programs that you can excel in where the competition is low and you're able to build brand, especially on a regional level before you go nationally is incredibly important. And so my number one tip that I offer people, and it's not usually what they're wanting to hear, but I think it's very, very true, is be strategic before you launch and then also be strategic in where you place your resources and your dollars. So even if you're planning on launching a lot of programs, understanding the programs where that marketing dollar will go the furthest because your competition is low, your niche is valuable, what you offer and bring to the table is different than your competitors, is really important to understand. And again, it goes back to understanding in terms of identity who you are and how that distinguishes you from other people. So we've worked with quite a few clients who have a religious niche to their university. And in certain areas, that really differentiates them from the big players. It brings a value to a lot of potential students that they care about and that matters to them. And so being able to market on that distinguishing factor is very valuable and important. I don't know if Shalise has anything to add to this because she's like the second piece of it. But I would definitely start with research and understand your distinguishing factors before you start to market and then optimize those down the funnel. Awesome. We have time for one more since we're trying to get you guys out of here on time. One last one for Shalise. Uh, with the marketing landscape changing all the time and new channels popping up all over the uh, all over the place, the question is, how do you test new channels and determine early indicators to see if it's worth continuing to fund? And when do I decide whether to pull funds from other channels in order to budget for these initiatives? Yeah, so that's a great question, and it's one that we address all the time on behalf of our partners. Um, you know, in general, when looking at new channels and, and understanding whether or not I should allocate funds to them and bring them onto my buy, really it goes back to the foundation of what we talked about, and I feel like I'm, you know, beating the same drum here, but knowing your numbers, right, and knowing your goals, um, because there will generally always be some component of your portfolio that's not performing at that level. Um, and so we do encourage our partners to earmark a component of their budget for testing, for continuous testing and optimization, um, because in this world that we live in where things are rapidly changing, 
Um, you know, if you don't have any budget allocated for testing, it's going to be a difficult place to be um, because we have such high expectations of our dollars and we expect so much from them across the board already. Um, and so if you don't have budget already for testing or for new initiatives, what I would say is to evaluate your current portfolio and understand the lowest performing areas um, and the impact of cutting those areas. So if I understand that one component of my, you know, non-branded paid search is really moving on to, you know, $10,000 cost per enroll, for example, um, I might cut that component for a few months and try something out um, in a different area to see if I can beat it. Um, and if I can, great. Then I want to continue down that trail and really understand what, you know, what is performing um, and where is it performing at um, and what do I gain um, and what are my opportunity costs of this. Um, but really, again, it comes down to what am I performing at and that cost per environment um, and how is this channel capable of driving that type of interest for me? Um, and, you know, we, we generally start small. We want to win small um, and then learn how to grow it. And so, it, you know, it's not, don't, don't knee jerk it. Don't rip the Band-Aid off. It's not all or nothing. But make sure that you are evaluating some of the poor performing areas of your buy, um, you know, even back to what Dee had brought up about the fares. Perhaps that wasn't the best performing component. So maybe we cut one or two and take that money and reinvest it um, and, and really just understand the outcome there. But again, setting goals for that effort um, so that you're very clear and you're very able to communicate down the funnel. Um, I'm doing this and this is why and I expect these things from it. Um, and then we can come back and say, I expected this and this is what happened. Um, and that's how we can drive success and really um, long term hopefully get budget to continually test and optimize our channels in that same way. Shalise, thank you. Michelle, thank you. And thank you all so very much for attending, uh, attracting today's higher ed students. Again, we will be sending the materials from today's webinar to all participants afterward, so you can share this deck and this presentation with any folks at your institution that might need to hear this stuff. Uh, and now is a great time to head to our website at helixeducation.com and download your free copy of the second edition of our Enrollment Growth Playbook that was just released today. Have a wonderful afternoon, and we'll see you next time.